So uh, tonight's installment of the Fordham New York Public Library lecture series is, as you can see, uh, getting acquainted after the war, American Jews meet Moroccan Jews during the 1940s and 1950s. And our lecturer is one of the many types that kind of hang out in the Jewish division, <laughs> the Jewish division of the New York Public Library, uh, Dr. Michal Ben Yaakov of the Baraka College. Uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, Dr. Ben Yaakov received her PhD from Hebrew University in Jerusalem and is Associate Professor of History at the Ephrata College of Education uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, she was the first director of its unique graduate program in memory, heritage, and education. And her research centers on Jews in 19th, at 19th and 20th century North Africa and Eretz Israel, Palestine as well as the experiences of North African Jews during both world wars. Uh, she focuses on the experiences of Jewish women, particularly, uh, but not exclusively in those communities. She has lectured widely in Israel, the United States, and Europe, and published over 40 articles and edited three conference volumes. Her recent article, um, uh, which is in French, and so I won't try to pronounce the um, Title, but it's about Elaine Kasey Benatar um, and her activities in favor of refugee uh, Jews in Morocco, 1940 to 43. And it sets the groundwork for her current research project on American perspectives on Moroccan Jews in the decade after World War II. So welcome, Dr. Nafal Ben Yaakov. Thank you very much for coming on this evening between the weather and the elections. And um, excuse my protein, but New York weather hasn't improved my health. So, um, I begin with a heartfelt thanks to all those that are involved in the Fordham University New York Public Library Research Fellowship in Jewish Studies. Those that spoke this evening, Professor Michael Peter, the Shrekin Chair in Jewish Studies, uh, Professor Ben Rosona, also of Fordham, Director <coughs> David Forsen, head of the Jerome Jewish Division, and I did my homework to check exactly what the name was. <laughs> and the efficient staff there, and I'm sure any and all of you that will go there will also enjoy their efficient help. And it is certainly a pleasure to be with you here in New York. Um, during the 1940s, and during the early 1940s, Hundreds of refugees arrived in the United States on ships from Morocco. A fact reported in the New York Times, a fact reported in the New York Times and in the Jewish press in the United States. But did Morocco register in the minds of American Jews as they read the news? Just a month after the Allied invasion, invasion of North Africa and U.S. troops arriving on the shores of Morocco in November 1942, Casablanca suddenly burst into, the, into American homes. Yes, fortunate timing for Warner Brothers, the film Casablanca made its debut. However, what is remembered generally is the wartime romance when an ex-patron, Henry Bo uh, Humphrey Bogart, meets his former lover, Ingrid Bergman. The context of the film has largely been overlooked and forgotten, and few remember the, the scenes of refugees arriving on the shores of North Africa in the markets of Casablanca or facing the challenges of daily life. So,
with the fall of France, the movie, of course, continues with the intrigue of uh, foreign agents and the love story. And what we didn't hear on this opening scene is that the refugees were, in fact, Jews. With the fall of France in, in June 1940, thousands of European Jews sought temporary shelter in Morocco, remaining a day, a week, months, or even a few years before continuing their journey to seek their permanent residence, most of them in the United States, where many had family. American Jewish organizations began aiding refugees in Morocco, as well as working on behalf of North African Jews to reinstate their rights annulled by the Nazi-inspired Vichy regime. After Operation Torch, the Allied invasion on November 8th, 1942, so we have a couple events this week that exactly 76 years ago. Direct contact was made by hundreds if not thousands of Jewish soldiers who served in the American forces in North Africa in general and in the large bases in Morocco in particular. American Jewish rabbis served as chaplains and American Jewish organizations sent representatives to North Africa and others came on fact-finding missions during the war and after. All these came home and told their stories, or maybe they didn't. News items on Moroccan Jewry appeared in the Jewish press and in the New York Times, much of it sent by Jewish organizations, the UJA, the Joint the JPC, the World Jewish Congress, the American Jewish Committee, and others, but was it assimilated? Was it absorbed? And at this um, middle stage of my research, I ventured to say no. If you ask, did you read about Moroccan Jews in the 40s? That's something that was cognizant at the time. Never heard anything, but it's in the newspapers. During the 19th and early 20th century, North American Jews were largely unknown to American Jews and considered exotic. There their communities far flung. Sporadic contact was made between the communities of the two areas um, from the mid 1800s, primarily through the writings of Jewish travelers, such as the British Elkin Nathan Adler, the American Cyrus Adler, and the Russian born Nahum Schluss. Most of their publications in English published by the Jewish Publication Society or in installments in the Jewish press as well as reports, other reports in the Jewish newspapers, generally in times of distress. The American Israelite, a Cincinnati-based Jewish newspaper that was distributed throughout the country, for example, had some 90 articles on Moroccan Jews before World War I. Certainly not daily or weekly reports, but it was in fact a taken note. Notice was in fact taken particularly during times of crisis, which is no surprise. In the early 1860s, in the wake of the Spanish-Moroccan War, as well as the time of the International Algeciras Conference in Spain in 1906. At that time, Jacob Schiff, the noted American leader, no, American Jewish leader, noted that, quote, whilst in most Mohammedan countries, the position of the Jews has been favorable. This did not hold true for Morocco where they were subjected to oppression and degradation as, fear, as severe as that during the Middle Ages in Europe, end quote. Jewish leaders pressured the American government to demand the rights of Jews in any agreement signed. However, American Jews perceived Moroccan Jews to be under the patronage of the enlightened French Jewry and its Alliance Universelle, Universelle the AIU, and as such, left most of the political and humanitarian intervention to them, especially during the period of the French colonial rule. The World Jewish Congress, the Day Brit, the American Jewish Committee, all had close ideological ties with the AIU, which was active in the sphere of quote unquote, or without quotes, regenerative education in Morocco, already from 1862 and were committed to improving the political situation of the Jews in Morocco and not their migration. If we fast forward to the period after World War II, 
The New York Times published several items on the Jews in North Africa, and actually to a lesser degree, the American Jewish newspapers. And now, at the New York Public Library, I'm examining newspapers, particularly in the communities outside New York. Those, the Jewish newspapers in Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Chicago, Minneapolis, Los Angeles, Denver. As expected, items appeared in times of crisis, as riots and the massacres of Jews in Tripoli, in Libya, that ravaged for four days, again this week, 73 years ago, in November 1945. Uh, and then there were there riots and killings also in the Moroccan, as well as in the Algerian, and um, as well as in Tripoli, in June of 1948. But again, I ask, do the readers in the United States connect to these events? How do they relate to them? It seems, to some extent, it seems that some interest was expressed. And in a December 1948 um, letter, Rabbi Herbert A. Friedman, a rising um, American Jewish leader, having served as chaplain in the army, answered an inquiry about speakers who could discuss the, the situation of Jews in Muslim countries. Friedman suggested the ex-chaplains, quote, I know several men who returned from North Africa with an almost crusading zeal to spread the word about the intolerable conditions there, end quote. However, I could not find any evidence of their talks, sermons, articles, or whatever, until last week, of course, your discoveries are by chance or not by chance, going through the Baltimore Jewish News, I finally found one such article by Rabbi Selwyn Ressländer, who spent over a year in Morocco. But as you can see, the far-flung corners on inner pages, I'm not sure this is a, actually the crusading zeal that um, Friedman spoke about, and it's on the same page competing with the best gold medal eggnog. <laughs> so um, you could see the sort of the juxtaposition of the information. I would like now to divide this brief presentation into three parts. A short description of the development of the project and its direction. Some of my findings, particularly those that I discovered here the last two weeks in the New York Public Library are preparing for work here. And finally, some preliminary thoughts and directions on American Jewish perspectives, conceptions, and misconceptions of Moroccan Jewry during the critical decade between World War II and the beginning of the mass migration of Moroccan Jews primarily to Israel in 1955. I first began some 35 years ago or longer while working on a master's thesis at Hebrew University on the topic of the efforts of American Jewish organizations on behalf of North African Jews, November 42, October 43, a period delimited by the um, military and political events from the first major American involvement in military activities overseas to the liberation, with quotes or without quotes, of North Africa from Nazi-inspired Vichy rule. And that until the formal instatement of the rights of Jews there that happened only 11 and a half months after the American invasion. Um, and this, in large part, was due to the intervention of American Jewish organizations. In the process, I uncovered the activities of Helen Kazaz ben a basically unknown Moroccan Jewish female attorney, so she's certainly one of the run-of-the-mill Moroccan Jewish female and uh, an attorney, who initiated Refugee Assistance Committee for tens of thousands of ref Jewish refugees and others interned who had escaped the flames of Europe to the fire escape of Morocco, what we saw in the very opening scene of Casablanca. Um, shortly before her death in, 19, in 1979, Benatar gave her archives of her wartime activities to the Central Archives for the History of the Jewish People in Jerusalem. And a year later, I met her 
by reading the 115 files that she had passed on, and was then intrigued by this unique woman who managed to succeed in creating full cooperation between a wide range of international organizations and government bodies, a goal which the male leadership had not been able to attain. Okay, from the summer of 1940 until the last of the refugees had found permanent residence and other destinations, primarily the United States in 1946, she then redirected her efforts on behalf of local Jews. And she had been involved in local uh, assistance committees as those befitting upper middle class of women in Casablanca. Although I later continued my doctorate on a somewhat unrelated topic of North African Jews in 19th century Palestine, my interest <coughs> continued on the somewhat unlikely topic of American-Moroccan Jewish relations after the war. Beyond official organizational activities and beyond the war years, in recent years, not only has interest in research increased on the implications of the Holocaust for American Jews, but also interest in North African Jews during World War II, and I combined the two and returned to this topic. I began to re-examine the subject through a case study of this extraordinary woman. And this topic raised not only straight historical questions, but questions of gender, philanthropy, social action, and social activism. During the Vichy years, 1940 to 1942, the number of refugees in Morocco increased drastically. In Casablanca, Casals Benatar responded immediately to the cry for assistance and not only came to the aid herself, but established a refugee assistance committee, which developed into a worldwide network with international support. By August of 1940, uh, she had initiated contact with international aid organizations, including the New York-based American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, the Joint with the JDC, and began a 15-year relationship with them as a de facto representative in Morocco, and later for all of North Africa, and acted as their legal counsel for Morocco until 1953 with no pen. Kazas Benatar initiated cooperation with Hayes, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, the European offices of the Jewish Emigration Association, HISA, and later the Philadelphia-based Quakers American Friends Service Committee, the FSC. As the number of refugees increased and the communal resources of the Jewish community in Casablanca became even more strained, having to deal simultaneously with the local Jewish population suffering from the enforcement of Le Vichy legislation and the overall exigencies of the war. Benatar developed her context and cooperation also with non-Jewish societies and Jewish communities in other major cities and towns. After Operation Torch in November 1942, the number of new arrivals from Europe decreased due to the closed escape routes and the increased military activity in the Mediterranean. However, thousands of foreign Jews who had detained as former soldiers of the French Foreign Legion, something that you also don't know from the movies Casablanca and many others of the French Foreign Legion riding out into the desert, that a great many of them were Eastern European Jews who were in France and in either to escape being um, expelled or to show the patriotism, could not go into the French army and they went into the French Foreign Legion. But that's a whole other story. After the invasion, they were incarcerated in labor camps and were only gradually, with much pressure, released in Morocco, and they joined the refugees. The absence of the refugees and these internees in the overall story of survivors is particularly startling, as we know of tens of thousands who were saved in this way. But that, again, is a separate story. After the war, 
Benatar continued her activities, continued her activities in wider spheres in the Jewish communities in North Africa, cooperating with Zionist organizations as well. She read, wrote articles for the JD, for the J, these are pictures of the internees that were from the French Foreign Legion that were in labor camps in the deserts. Um, Kazaz Benatar wrote articles that were in um, the various Jewish organizational and publications as well as in the Jewish press. Um, she wrote in the American Jewish Yearbook during the early 50s every year articles on each of the countries of North Africa, for example. In 1953, she made an extensive but somewhat publicized speaking tour in the United States on behalf of the United Jewish Appeal, the UJA, in order to acquaint American Jews with North African Jewry and their needs, as well as the refugee assistance which had been offered to Jews who had escaped Europe by Morocco during the war. She made a subsequent second visit in, 19, in February 1954. However, my work has indicated that research through the prism of Helen Casas Benetton is only part of the story, and the picture is actually larger and more complex than <coughs> only her sphere alone. Although organizational histories and archives paint the picture of formal activities, I am interested in the interaction between American and Moroccan Jews themselves during the latter years of the war and after, and ask what influence these direct contacts had on the perspective of American Jews. Histories of American Jewish organizations only briefly mention activities in North Africa and require a re-examination and reinterpretation of them, meshing the intersections of American and Moroccan Jewish history. My current project is actually re-examining and expanding an excellent and original work of Professor Yaron Sor in Hebrew, whose award-winning 201 um, book, A Torn Community, The Jews of Morocco and Nationalism, 1943 to 1954, in which he studied the activities of American Jewish organizations in Morocco from the Moroccan point of view, from that of Moroccan Jews as well as that of Dr. Avi Picard, whose work on the Moroccan Jews has focused on the activities, strategies, and funding of Zionist activities, their organizations and leaders, primarily regarding Aliyah, immigration to Israel from Morocco, <coughs> and steps taken um, for their um, uh, trip in the mid-1950s. Relevant to this study is this 2014 article Funding Aliyah, American Jewry and North African Jews, 1952-56. However, the picture is not complete without examining the attitudes and perceptions of the third variable of the equation, American Jews and their leaders, their perspectives, in addition to those of Moroccan and Zionist or Israeli positions. Although American Jewish philanthropic and welfare activities continued well into the 1960s, and to some extent in Morocco even today, assisting with health, education, and welfare, often cooperating with the World Zionist Organization, the initial contacts, the dilemmas they raised, the accommodations made, and the perceptions of American Jews regarding Moroccan Jewry have been neglected. And so this project hopes to rectify that lacuna, reaching beyond Kazaz Benatar in the war years, and asking where did all this activity lead? Primarily, but not exclusively, through American Jewish newspapers, as mentioned, at the New York Public Library, which has the single largest collection of such um, publications. The Holocaust and World War II changed the face of world Jewry and the perception of American Jews regarding world Jewry. However, did they include North African Jews and Moroccan Jews in particular? As a result of direct contact, the American Jewish soldiers and chaplains, organizational representatives who actually were in Morocco, refugees who passed through Morocco and settled in the United States, and through indirect information through news items in Jewish newspapers and journals, talks, meetings, etc. Being optimistic, I originally thought, naturally, 
but how did they change them? However, since working on this project for the last year or so, my answer has become much more negative, saying there wasn't any significant change, and why is this so? Um, I had hoped to find an answer by following the trail of Kazaz Benatar as she went from city to city in 1953 and 1954, three months each year speaking in the United States coast to coast on behalf of the UJA. Um, and we can see um, one, one um, pamphlet. It is through um, the United Jewish Appeal proudly presents an outstanding spokesman for the Jews of North Africa proclaimed a UJA pamphlet. Here the woman who, divide, who defied the pro-Nazi Vichy authorities to save Jewish lives. Upon arriving in New York, she spoke at the opening rally of the women's division in New York, sharing the stage with the main speaker, Eleanor Roosevelt, who lauded her efforts during the war as well as that done after. I began my work by looking for reactions to this trip, following the Jewish newspapers in those cities. However, little is found, or until now I have found very little. Reading through 10 years of weekly Jewish newspapers, even when focusing on the specific events as those that I mentioned, the riots in November of 1945, the riots of June 1948, um, the border towns of um, Ujda and Jirada in Morocco and again in Tripoli. Although thousands had moved, had uh, thousands of Moroccan Jews had immigrated to Israel immediately after the establishment of the state, mass immigration was yet to come. I must say, by going through the newspapers and not searching out, you know, with all the improvements in technology, you have this great tool of digitalizing the newspapers. So you look for a keyword and you find it. But not all have been digitalized. Some are on microfilm and some I'm turning the pages. Okay, so this puts things a bit more in perspective because timing of parallel news items must also be taken into consideration. The UJA annual campaign was held in the early spring months and therefore Helen Kazaz ben Atan and other news had to vie with Manischewitz advertisements for Pesach for <laughs> wine and matzahs. So you see these huge advertisements. And then at one particularly large meeting, which I expected to find results of in Boston, the day before Stalin's, um, the results of Stalin's uh, doctor's trial, Jewish doctor's trials in the Soviet Union came out, so of course, anything as insignificant as Helen Kazaz Benatar and Moroccan Jewry were pushed to the side. With the organization's activities continuing and expanding in Morocco, Moses W. Beckelman, the Director General for Overseas Operation of the JDC, at the UJA Annual Conference at the Waldorf Astoria in December 1954, extolled the advances made by the JDC the OSE and others, noting, quote, it is no longer news to American Jewish audiences, as it was four or five years ago, that living as a native Jews in these backward Muslim countries is a compost of sheer physical misery and human degradation. But in fact, was it news? What was actually known already in 1954 to American Jewish audiences? There was much misery, poverty, and sickness among the Moroccan Jewish lower classes. This is what struck the American Jews visiting and working in Morocco. The strangeness. A Jew from Dallas said, what are you doing with these blacks? A JDC worker reported, Jews, the Moroccan Jews, were strange world to them. The Jew, that is the American Jew, identified with Eastern European Jew. It was easier to identify with the Ashkenazi Jew from where his father or grandfather stemmed than it was to this fellow who lived in the dirt of Morocco. And another reported, I had never seen Jews from an Arab country. They looked to me exactly like Arabs. I said to myself, what do I have in common with these people? 
I don't have any common language, no common culture. We don't even look alike. However, during the relative stability of prosperity between the two wars under French colonial rule, a new middle class had developed, even, and even the lower middle class had changed. And perhaps more importantly for, Jewish, for international Jewish dialogue, a Francophone westernized social and economic elite, the group Yaron Sor designates as the reformist, reformistic sector. It is these leaders who hosted and guided the American Jews on their trip. It is they who participated in the international Jewish conferences as the War Emergency Conference in Atlantic City in 1944 and the annual conferences of the JDC in Europe. These are the leaders who looked, acted, and often thought just as American Jewish leaders, looking to improve the situation of the downtrodden. They also had close ideological ties with the AIU and were committed to improving the political situation of the Jews in Morocco, as did the Jews of the as did the leaders of the World of the World Jewish Congress beneath the American Jewish Committee. The JPC and OSE, OSE, the Children's Aid Society, the International Jewish Health Organization, went in with wider relief rehabilitation and health goals, not political agendas. Only when the political and economic situation in Morocco was no longer viable for Jews after Moroccan independence in 1956, did these leaders begin openly supporting Aliyah or other migration to countries, generally France or Canada, and ultimately cooperated with the Jewish agency and the state of Israel with aims of Aliyah. Photos of the Jews of Morocco published by the Jewish press and by the American Jewish organization support the exotic, primitive, and extreme poverty. Those of the photos of the leaders remain closed in the archives. From 1953, the JVC International Conference in Paris, Friedman, now a, a, a strong American Jewish uh, leader that I um, referred to previously, reported that the question was asked, why should we be concerned about these Moroccan Jews? Haven't they always lived in squalor and poverty? How far can we go to rescue every remote remnant of Jewish population? The questioner went on in this thing, expressing the mood apparently of, Mer very American, of many American Jews to wonder why the UJA money should be spent in this fashion. Friedman answered, reflecting both Zionist ideology and what Maud Mandel coined as philanthropy or cultural imperialism in her 2002 article subtitled The Impact of American Jewish Aid in Post-Holocaust France. Quote, Friedman continues, my answer to this comes from the heart. I am convinced that these people are good human material. They have been ground down under brutal poverty and ruthless Arab oppression for centuries. We have found them now in this condition. Miracles have been wrought in the four short years that organized help has been brought to them. They constitute a small replacement for the six million of Europe. If we have found this reservoir, let us not be dismayed by the temporary burden it represents, but let us rejoice rather that there are those who can again be gathered to, endure, to enlarge the fold. Why be concerned about them? Simply because they are ours. Hal Lehman addressed this very question in a series of articles and commentary after his 1953 trip to Morocco. One that was not descriptive presented the title of the article, North American Dilemmas for American Jewry behind the present debate on community priorities, in which the situation of the Jewish communities of Morocco, from the viewpoint of American Jewish responsibility overseas, of American Jewish responsibility overseas versus the postponed domestic need. Year after year, he wrote, since 1945, 
and it's become increasingly evident that American Jewish fundraising policies have influenced far beyond the limits of the community and the borders of the United States, and that American Jewry's vast philanthropic responsibilities to Jews elsewhere profoundly affects the patterns and directions of Jewish communal life here at home." End quote. So, were the American Jews presented only with the, memory, with the misery? And there was much. In order to get funding, and thereby ignoring the influential and Western-oriented Jews of Morocco? Were the Americans attempting to take all the credit for creating modern infrastructure, belittling the existing work primarily of the AIU, however problematic, and decades of efforts before World War I, why declaring that they were in fact reinforcing existing community? I hesitantly say yes and suggest Mandel's model of yes, philanthropy was cultural imperialism. However, this story must be put in the larger picture of American Jewry at the time. After more than a decade of concentrated efforts on behalf of European Jews, often ignoring their own needs, most American Jews were looking inward, back to investing in American Jewish communities and their institutions for the post-war generation, as well as integrating those Holocaust survivors in American life, and of course, major support for Israel before and after its independence. So did American Jews have to be convinced of their responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis Moroccan Jews, as suggested by Lehman, or were they considered just a side story? As for preliminary conclusions, and I stress these are preliminary conclusions, Information on the Jews of Morocco did exist during the decade between World War II and the mass migration of tens of thousands of Moroccan Jews to Israel, both from the personal experiences of soldiers, chaplains, agency workers, refugees arriving in the United States, and from published accounts and, and newspaper articles. However, it seems to me that this information, as the information published on Jews on refugees fleeing Europe via Morocco, remained just that, unrelated information, not grounded in the experience of most American Jews, and therefore not absorbed. All in all, in the, archives, the archives and the press point to the fact that after the war, former chaplains and Jewish organization representatives focused their concerns, sermons, writings on local issues and on bolstering the newly established state of Israel. This is what American Jews heard and read. Not being able to absorb information from remote corners, from corners so remote from the European roots. Information on the Jews of Morocco remained just that, unrelated information, not grounded in experience or connected. I am considering the relevancy of a paradigm developed by Professor Hannah Yablonka regarding the consciousness of the Holocaust among Jews in pre-state and state of Israel during and after the war. One of information which could only be put together and digested during the second and third decade of the state. What Yablanka calls from information to knowledge. Only that in, after the information was worked and reworked could any overall consciousness be developed. Similar ideas of fact and information versus an assimilated picture may be drawn from Hasia Diner's study of a Holocaust remembrance in the United States and Beth Cohen's work on the experience of Holocaust survivor refugees in post-war America, as well as Anita Shapiro's study in Israel, all of which point to the conclusion that although it was thought that nothing was known or done, in fact, we can now piece together the information and realize how much was known or done, but just not absorbed into a larger picture. The case of the perception of American Jews regarding Moroccan Jews in the 1940s and 50s was even more disparate, as the information fell on virgin territory. More than that, it seems to me that the preconceived, of the preconceived perceptions of the other 
as it captured in the title of a 1951 book I just uncovered and haven't had the chance to read much of, written by Lawrence Reznor, Eternal Stranger, The Plight of the American Jew from Baghdad to Casablanca. And in full page ads of the annual UJA campaign, which contributed to the marketing of the stranger in order to get funding for projects. And these did not inspire understanding, further knowledge, or change perceptions. So I began my talk when I originally said the title as getting acquainted after the war, colon. American Jews meeting Moroccan Jews in the 40s and 50s. I then changed to my um, opening uh, slide, getting acquainted after the war, question mark. And now, after glancing at um, Reznor's book and others, perhaps I should say getting acquainted after the war or the eternal stranger, American Jews and Moroccan Jews in the 1940s and 50s. Thank you. So we have some time for questions. And, uh, you have questions for Please, I know if you came up to me before, and I know you wanted about Moroccan Jews in Morocco and Moroccan Jews in Canada or in the United States, and I didn't talk about any of that. Sprung on you a different topic. If there's any questions, yes. Well, I have that question. So there were uh, Sephardic Jews and uh, um, Middle Eastern Jews in the United States. Uh, did you find anything that they had any kind of different attitudes or that they were acting in any way that was different from the majority of actually not American Jews? Well, for certainly what I've been going through now, I've gone about through about a third of the 15 interviews that are at the New York Public Library. In the early 1990s, there was an oral history project by the American Jewish Community and the Drug Division of the New York Public Library. And they were interested in interviewing um, Sephardic Jews in the United States. I don't know there how many, um, probably hundreds of them, I don't exactly know the numbers. But I came down to 15 that were from Morocco. So I began reading them. So obviously their information was they were Moroccan Jews that had settled here. So obviously their ideas and perceptions. Each of them had, uh, that I managed to read, and hopefully tomorrow I will continue, um, uh, have a different story. But I was reading them because I wanted to say, I wanted to see if they mentioned how others perceived them. And I didn't get that at all. Some of them were, one of the interviewers, in my opinion, didn't know a lot before she asked. It was sort of like, what do you eat and what did you do in Morocco kind of questions. Um, others arrived different ways. Um, some via um, Montreal. They went to those that, for one reason or another, weren't going to Israel because they had family or were looking for other opportunities, went to Montreal, where Canada had a fairly open and liberal immigration policy, and Montreal was French-speaking, and they were French-speaking, so those that didn't go to France went to Montreal, and some of them then from Montreal, often for business reasons, ended up in New York. Um, others, uh, for example, uh, Professor Henry Toledano from Hofstra University, who I think Don is, I knew him from years ago. Um, for example, he was brought over in the, at the same time, in 1953, 1954, 1955, there were other, also other organizations working in Morocco. And there were some various um, uh, uh, yeshiva <coughs> organizations that were looking for scholars in Morocco to reinforce yeshivas in the United States that no longer had the Eastern European um, students coming in. So that's how he and a group of students came, and he remained here. because He was uh, the son of a very renowned uh, uh, Moroccan uh, uh, rabbi in uh, Meknes. Um, so everyone had their own story, but I guess it didn't interest the interviewer to find out how others saw them 
It just they wanted to know how you, you know, where did you come from, how did you get here, and what did you do kind of interviews. What about but I'm continuing to look. You know, uh, communal organizations in the United States, whether they have a different relationship to them. It's an interesting question. Um, what was the question? The, you want to repeat the question? Well, I guess this is a follow-up, which was that the question is about uh, Sephardic and Mizrahi communal organizations in the United States, whether they have made efforts to a North African Jewry that were different from the mainstream of Ashkenazi and Ashkenazi. Were there landsmanschafts for Mizrahi? There were. There were, but not Moroccan, because you had, you had true groups that, this is not my area of specialties, um, uh, you might know more. Um, for example, Aviva Ben Hor has written about um, the Sfardim in, in the United States. So you had those that congregated around, you know, of course, the original Jewish settlers that came from the United States were Sfardim, and those that established the Sharit, uh, uh, the Sharit Israel synagogue here in New York, and others in New Orleans, Charleston, etc. Um, and then you had um, many, many. Um, Turkish Jews that came around the time of the instability of the breaking down of the Ottoman Empire at the beginning of the 20th century, 1905, 1908, 1912. There are many, many um, Jews. And so they, they as opposed to the, the Sephardic Jews that were in the United States, who had already become somewhat assimilated between the, the waves of immigration and German and Eastern European Jews, um, they formed their own communities in specific areas. So you have um, those Ladino speaking, and they had, there was a Ladino press actually um, in, in Seattle, in New York, there were communities. Uh, then the Syrian Jews. But in order to have some kind of language, you have to have some kind of critical mass. You know, otherwise you sort of form, you join what's closest to you. So. That's not my area of expertise. Anybody that knows more perhaps could answer you. I know of nothing, certainly not in the early 1950s. So I'm Moroccan, French, and American. And I grew up in Morocco my first 10 years. My family is from where? Casablanca. Mm -hmm. My family is from Morocco, from a generation. And so um, what I was wondering, about, to uh, talk is, was there an awareness from the American Jewish organization in the 50s and 60s that in fact uh, the American community, the Jewish American community, had been uh, strongly supported or even saved, that is American Jews like to say, by the king of Morocco from the Nazi regime and deportation. You know that there is this understanding that um, the, when the French, when the British government said uh, the Jews of Morocco had to wear the yellow star, the king uh, of Morocco said, uh, if the Jews, the Jews of Morocco are my subjects, if the Jews of Morocco are going to wear the yellow star, then all of my subjects are going to wear the yellow star, including me. And that. OK, this is a widely held myth that has to be um, analyzed because it, I never got as far as the Yellow Star story. But this it's is something the, all Mother Akin Jews believe that the, the king saved the them. Life. But by looking in the archives, and Michelle Abidon has written on this as well as others after, actually it was a power play. Because the king wanted to show, the sultan wanted to right. show that he was in charge. Of course. Okay, so and they wanted to show that they were in charge. And who was the little pawn? The Jews were the pawn. So the fact was, but the thing is, in general, it did have rather good relations with the Jews. But at that time, um, the Sultan was ra rather powerless. But he was still the figurehead but uh, within the French colonial rule. OK, but so when the American Jewish leaders we're having all kinds of negotiations with the Moroccan leaders in, say, 19, from 1953, 4, 5, 6, leading up until independence in 1956. 
And shortly afterwards, they were talking to everybody. They were talking to the Sultan, they were talking to the heads of the different independence um, parties prior to um, independence, they were talking to the French, but they were trying to improve this situation, they were talking to everybody, and everybody was promising everything, you know? So um, I haven't looked into specifically the relations as a focus, just as I'm going through all these organizational materials, they're having meetings all the time. And then you also see the different infighting between the JBC that has their agenda and the World Jewish Congress who has their agenda and everyone's meeting and if they happen to come at the same week, so who's going to talk to who and who talks, you know, who spoke to who. So that the main um, gist in the mid 50s was have freedom of mobility that Jews could stay or Jews could leave, that they could get passports, they wouldn't have to illegally emigrate, whether it be to Canada or whether it be to Israel. So they were talking to everybody. But the, but the Americans never helped in terms of the Jews leaving illegally. The American government, as far as I know, no. But they, they weren't going to get involved. But even the American Jewish organizations. The American Jewish organizations kept these negotiations top secret. The papers are just coming out in the last but decade. But I know for a fact that when my relatives left Morocco, they left illegal through right. different... What year? In 19, like my aunt and my uh, uncle left for, for Israel, probably in like 1948, 1950. And they did it through Algeria by walking through... Okay, yeah. so, so what happened they, is actually, you know, which is one of the reasons why the, um, I showed a, a newspaper, it said Algerian Jews, but actually it was in the um, Moroccan towns of Ujda and uh, Jarada, which were right near the Algerian border that the Moroccan Jews used to leave. But um, you had all different periods between the French rule and independence rule, and then so between 1948 and 1961, it really depended what year and what month, whether there was approval to get passports or wasn't approval. There 300 a month to get approval when 800 wanted to leave. So there was a lot of legal and illegal um, mobility, which is why all the, all the organizations, no matter what their agenda, were trying to get what they called freedom of mobility. Okay, so yes, there are many, many illegal Emigrants, because they could not get permission. Others did get permission, but depended when and from where and from, from whom. Yes. I want to say that Jews in the Arab countries were not allowed to go directly to Israel. So went to depends Europe. when. Depends when and where. They did from Yemen. They did from Yemen. They well, did from trip from Libya. Yeah. Libya, there was a direct uh, airlift. Iraq, there was a direct airlift from Morocco, no. But other countries, yes. Again, it depends when and where. Who was moving the place? There was a lot of... Uh, One question. Um, I, I heard years ago that the uh, first postmaster general in Morocco was a Jew, and the king walked into the uh, synagogue Saturday morning. Is that true? I don't know what in synagogue, but yes, there were there were ministers in the there were um, high officials in the what do you call secretary of the of the post, etc. That were Jews. Yes. In the United States. No, in Morocco. In Morocco. Which this ended already around 1961, 62. Everything become very um, not only Moroccan but Arab and Pan Arab. So it became everything Arabic and more. Um, Islamic law, so it became more and more difficult. This is when Halal Kazaz ben Atam, from 56 to 61, she was going back and forth between Paris and Casablanca, and finally in 61, she, she moved to, to Paris. Yes? Yeah, just so I have a concept to go with, could you give me approximate numbers in terms of, we're talking roughly um, early 40s to early 60s, what would have been the, um, approximate population of, of the native Jewry within um, Morocco, the refugee population that was coming from um, parts of Europe, and then of that population, 
how many actually emigrated and what percentage were emigrating to North America, U.S., Canada, and what percentage were emigrating to Israel? Okay, let me just because okay. I don't know. And round, round figures at the end of World War II, around 1948, we're talking about approximately 300,000 Jews in Morocco. And of those, how many have okay. been? Okay, the number of refugees, nobody knows. Okay. Anywhere there are, um, there are estimates anywhere from 20,000 to 60,000. Okay. okay, in Benatar's archives, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people, okay? The Israel Genealogical Society wants to, me to go in and to get all the names, because the names could, could appear 20 times, they could appear once to find out. Now those people, again, they would, could have stayed only a few days if they had visas and ship tickets and everything, and they could have stayed for longer. By 1946, there were none of them were there. Maybe there were one or two that, you know, that married with local Jews. So we don't know what the refugee population at any one time was, because there's constantly coming in and out and going. There were, and there were too many Jews. I mean, there, there were so many problems in Casablanca. They had an idea that, okay, they were sending 200 to Meknes and 200 to Agadir and 200 to there, because you have to understand that Casablanca, when the French came, uh, French official, colonial rule in 1912, was, uh, Casablanca was like this sleepy little fishing town. What didn't have a port, it wasn't anything. It was the, as the French had developed it as a bustling port and metropolitan city. So as a bustling town and metropolitan city with a lot of economic opportunities, there was massive migration, particularly of the Jews, who went first from the smaller villages to the inland towns that were strong, traditional communities with a very strong infrastructure, and then from there to Casablanca. Casablanca, before the war, before the war was falling apart. It had no traditional infrastructure, and it had thousands and thousands of poor immigrant Jews coming into the city. So, you know, we talk about the squalor of Casablanca it couldn't cope with itself before the refugees, which I think is even more admirable how much they were helping the refugees. So some of the activities of Ben Atan was sort of shipping out those that didn't have immediate prospects of getting um, a passport and um, all the 15 different affidavits and everything needed, and uh, as well as shipping uh, tickets on a boat that were going to other communities, because the other communities also weren't wealthy, but they had an infrastructure that they could deal with 200 people coming in. And there's stories, people, you know, she remembers, and one woman remembers, you know, that they had, you know, every day, the three uh, bachelors would come to their house and eat lunch. I mean, you could do that with a existing community in Casablanca, they couldn't. Um, um, so that's about 300,000 Jews. Um, the names and, and no, no, 300,000 Moroccan Jews, 280,000, 300, you know, don't catch me on this. Depends who you're asking what. Now, I figured someone would ask these questions of, <laughs> of numbers. How many went to France or, or Canada? I have no idea. And that was generally later. That was generally around the time of independence, 1955, 1956 and certainly until after 1961. So I photocopied a page that gave the number of those that made Aliyah, those that went to Israel, okay? So from Morocco alone, it's under 7,048, 7,049, 4,050, 7,051 to Israel. To Israel, okay, so it's those kinds of numbers um, several thousand, until you get to 56. 1956, that's already 37,000. Then it goes down again, you know. So you have variables. So um, uh, you still have a viable community after 1956, because there are those that put their 
um, belief into a democratic country that had um, cabinet posts and ministers and secretary of the whatever you call it in England and America um, that had Jews in government positions, even high government positions. So there were those that with their faith in there say, okay, you know, it's always been hard for the Jews, but it'll get better. You know, this was in France and Germany and Poland and all kinds of places. You know, it's the same kind of reaction. Um, and then I said, then after 57, 58, again, it started deteriorating. I don't have the numbers at all from the places. I mean, the sentiment among the Jews of Morocco is that it really started deteriorating for real when uh, there was the uh, around the mid 60s to the later 60s, especially after the 1967 war. Well, actually, it was before that. After 61, when when the Arab, then it was no longer able to speak French in government positions. It all had to be in Arabic. Things had to be more and more according to Islamic law. And Morocco was also in a position between should they join the pan-Islamic um, uh, movement, um, not only in vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the Israel-Arab question, but in general in terms of their culture. And as the general atmosphere and culture became more and more Arabic, most of the Jews that were in good positions were of the Francophonic um, uh, sector. So it became more and more uncomfortable. As far as I know, Helen Kazaz Ben Attar could speak Arabic if she took her maid and to someone who cleaned and in the market, she could carry on her legal business in Arabic. She was doing it in French. And she wasn't the only one. It just became more and more uncomfortable. And then after 67, when Morocco started supporting the pan-Arab movement, things got worse. And then most left on their own, several thousand to the... Oh, as we ask. Uh, yes. You said that uh, American-Jewish relations with Morocco started as charitable, and then with the Aliyah migrations, became maybe a little bit more political, perhaps. And you also seem to say that uh, the charity relationship that American Jews have with Morocco uh, sort of uh, caused their, the American perceptions. So how did this change in uh, purpose of uh, involvement change perceptions, if at all? Um, the question, your question sort of divides up into several parts. First of all, what I'm trying to find out, what is their perceptions of you and me? You know, people in Sydney are not the head of the joint or the head of the World Jewish Congress or the head of the something, which is why I'm looking into American Jewish newspapers and not the internal reports of the, of the different organizations. Okay, so that's one thing to make. So if you're talking about philanthropic um, activity, you know, does the person who has the purse strings also have the strings what and how to do it? Okay, so in these pictures, even for this, the, um, the JDC archives has this picture saying a JDC supported Jewish day school in Casablanca, Casablanca in 1948. They tell you that it was a school that the Allianz had formed already 50 years ahead of time, and that, you know, they went in and were the ones doing it. So although they said they're reinforcing and supporting the existing communal structure, because their position wasn't to get everybody out until things become untenable. In fact, they are saying we're the ones that did it, which is really interesting. If you read any official joint history, they say the joint began their activities in 1943, et cetera, et cetera, or in 19, generally in 1947. Why? Because in 1947, an American Jewish man came to Morocco to be the representative and started because you know, whatever Helen Casas Benata had done seven years with joint money, that wasn't the joint. It's only when the American representative of the joint got there. So this is part of the person who has the first strings also has the strings for the push and pull. Now there's also uh, sometimes 
a clear line and sometimes a fuzzy line between the political activity and the philanthropic activity. The joint basically was not getting involved and theoretically had no political position except for getting all kinds of permission to do health education and welfare, which the country was very happy that somebody should take, out, take care of the health education and welfare, that which the alliance that AIU had done before. In terms of politics, this um, social and political Jewish elite also were not homo you know, homogenic in their, in their political um, beliefs, whether they should stay in Morocco, where they should start pushing for migration. There were the Zionists that were immediately speaking for Aliyah, those were talking with the different political parties. So um, anything that the American Jewish organization did po po politically was very hush hush, -hush and kept behind um, um, closed doors in order not to rock the boat too much. Well, semi-close, because it's already for 30 years the organizational archives have been open to look at all that stuff, so it's not too top secret. I don't know if that answered your question. Any more questions? I have a comment. A little tiny comment. It has nothing to do with Jews. I'm of American Jewish, Moroccan descent. This is about Morocco. Interesting. Morocco was the, was the first country to recognize the Muslims. Do you believe that? Before France came here, that's important for Morocco. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes, I know you didn't go beyond the 1950s, but to echo this question, do you have a statistic as to how many Jews left after the 67 war, as compared to the independence, for example? And I think this would be too big. Numbers? I just, as far as I know, something in 1970, maybe you would know, but I think there were 8,000 Jews. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about um, 1970, so we're talking about in how many? 25 years from 300,000 to 8,000? Wow. That's a lot of Jews leaving. Mm -hmm. But a lot left in 56 in Morocco. Yeah, yeah. So that would be a scary event. That's, that's was my question. Did they actually leave then or did they actually leave in 67? No, a lot. I said in '67, yes, but even more left in '61. There was a big wave uh, to France in '67 right. because that's that. when um, uh, yeah. different political party went in that was more oh, Arabized, oh, Arab Arabized. Oh, Arab oh, oh, and, and also France opened. Okay. So, so we have to have one more for question over there. Okay, so um, I'm wondering if this is a uh, if you can answer this the, the more conceptual question, and that is. Um, is there an identification um, that is unique to kind of Morocco, the country, or to North African um, French possessions, which will take it all the way from Libya all the way to, to Morocco? In other words, um, what's Morocco and what's North African? Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, it's like, it's like Algeria, Morocco, I mean, these kind of things are um, modern constructs. Um, and I, I'm just wondering if they, because you talked about Moroccan Jews, and you, um, Distinguished it between them and other North African Jews. I was struck by by that because I, isn't that sort of reading it, um, reading in the current states um, boundaries um, um, into the past? In other words, those border towns that you describe are they really border towns? Between, is this a border town between Algeria and Morocco when France dominated? I, I just don't know. I'm asking this because I don't know. Now it, it's a good. I mean. There was no Moroccan identity because people, I mean, traditionally, people would be from Marrakesh or Meknes or the southern area of Kabila. There, there wasn't any Moroccan Jew, okay? And this is a construct in itself. And also, the, you know, if we're talking about the 1800s, the borders were rather uh, fluid, <laughs> particularly in the desert areas, which were the little uh, settlements, so the borders were totally. Okay, in 1830, um, uh, France conquered Algeria. And actually, Algeria became one of the three different departments of France itself. It wasn't a col uh, colony. It was part of France. Okay, so then they had, it wasn't all like in one year they finished this because 
in the southern part and with different tribes, there were battles continuing. But during the 1830s and 1840s, clear borders were drawn for Algeria, except they were a little fuzzy in the South Desert, but on the east and the west. So that there was a clear border between the Moroccan uh, Sharifian Sultanate and Algeria. Okay, so just as a curious aside, a lot of Moroccan Jews that were going to Israel first they went to Algeria not only because, for example, the big port city of Oban is on the western coast of Algeria, so it's very easy for Moroccan Jews, but they would get there and then they would get to um, 19th century Palestine and tell the French consul that they're Algerian and therefore they should have French citizenship and French protection, and actually they were Algeria, but that's a, a side story. Okay, the same thing happens between um, Libya was conquered by the Italians in 1911, and it became an Italian colony. Therefore, also those um, borders were clearly made. And then so as, and, and Tunisia was in 1881. So as the European powers were coming and making the colonies, they were, they were drawing the borders. Now, in terms of the overall Jewish identity, well, there's much more. I mean, you had clearly things that were Tripolitanian or Algerian or Moroccan, but if you're talking vis-a-vis -vis the Sephardic Jews of Turkey or Ashkenazi Jews, they had more in common with each other. So it's like, you were the one that asked about the Lanzenshaft. So it's the same thing. It, it depends on the critical mass, because if you have 100 Jews from all of North Africa, so it'll be a North African Jewish thing, you know. If you have 500 only from one city of Morocco, they could have their own thing. So the identity sort of tends to be fluid in, in the context of which it is um, developing. So thank you very much. Thank you.